What is wildlife habitat? Lesson three, cover. There are a number of different types of cover that wildlife require and that we need to consider when deciding if and how a parcel of land will function as habitat for a given wildlife species. When thinking about cover for wildlife, we need to consider denning and nesting cover, cover used while hunting, cover for avoiding predators, and seasonal or thermal cover. Many wildlife species have specific requirements for structures that allow them to hide their nest or to den. If these structures are not present, the wildlife species will not be present or they will not be able to breed successfully. For example, many birds and mammals require standing dead or alive trees with cavities for nesting or denning. We use the term cavity trees to refer to standing live or dead trees that have holes or cavities. We use the term snag to refer to dead trees that are still standing and snags often have cavities. Cavities can occur within the trunk of a tree or in the live or dead branches of a tree. Importantly, the size of the tree or the size of the branch determines what wildlife species can use it as a den or nest site. Trees or branches that are just large enough for a chickadee obviously aren't going to be large enough for a porcupine or a black bear. Each cavity using wildlife species requires trees larger than a certain minimum diameter to meet its nesting or denning needs. This chart from the publication Good Forestry in the Granite State lists the minimum tree diameters required by a sample of the cavity using wildlife species that occur in New England. The free PDF and online version of this document is available on the UNH Cooperative Extension website at extension.unh.edu forward slash good forestry. As a general rule, bigger is better for wildlife meaning that larger diameter trees can accommodate a greater range of wildlife body sizes than can smaller trees. And as the chart indicates, trees 24 inches and larger in diameter are able to accommodate even our largest cavity using species, the black bear. Birds that don't nest in cavities typically hide their nest within specific vegetation layers of different habitats. When you are outside, start looking for the presence or absence of vegetation within these four primary layers. Starting from the ground, look for the ground cover layer. This includes any herbaceous plants and any woody plants growing less than two feet tall, as well as any fallen logs, stones, and leaf litter. Above this is the shrub layer that includes shrubs and young trees growing between two to 15 feet tall. Above this is the mid-story layer that includes tall shrubs and trees growing between 15 to 30 feet tall. And at the top is the canopy layer. These are the trees growing over 30 feet tall. In the forest, certain birds nest primarily in the cover of the canopy of tall mature trees. For example, pine warblers nest high up in pine trees and scarlet tanagers nest in the dense foliage of deciduous trees. If a habitat doesn't have a canopy layer, you would not expect these birds to nest in that habitat. American red starts nest in the cover of deciduous foliage within the mid-story layer, and they are usually absent from forests, lacking trees 15 to 30 feet tall. Oven birds nest directly on the ground within the cover of fallen deciduous leaves, and they are often absent from softwood forests or any forests that lack the thick leaf litter they prefer as cover for nesting. About 40 bird species in New England make their nests within the cover of dense shrubs in habitats such as regenerating clear cuts, shrubby old fields, and transmission line rights away that have few or no overstory or midstory trees. If overstory trees grow up and shade out the shrubs, these birds disappear and are replaced by birds that nest in more mature forests. Wildlife that require marshes as their primary habitat often conceal their nest within the tall cover provided by dense emergent vegetation, such as cattails. Species such as muskrats and beavers construct their own denning cover. Here we can see a muskrat lodge, which characteristically is constructed out of cattail stalks. Birds that require field habitats for nesting usually make their nests directly on the ground in the cover of tall grasses near the very middle of a field. 
and small mammals and snakes associated with fields usually make their nests within the cover provided by what we call the litter layer, which is the dead vegetation or thatch that covers the ground under the taller live grasses. Cover is also particularly important for predators that rely on ambushing or stalking prey as their primary hunting strategy. Perhaps the best example of the importance of cover for hunting is shown in the posture and plumage of the American bittern that hunts fish, amphibians, snakes, and small mammals in shallow water along the edges of tall, dense cattails. Cover for nesting can also be called cover from predators because predation of eggs and nestlings is a primary source of mortality for birds during the nesting season. Birds that nest in cavity trees aren't immune to predators, but their nests are far less susceptible to predation than birds that make open cut nests on the ground or in the foliage of trees and shrubs. All sorts of animals, including snakes, raccoons, crows, blue jays, raptors, chipmunks and squirrels eat nestling birds and or bird eggs. So birds are very strategic about where within specific vegetation layers they locate their nests to hide them best from predators. For example, prairie warblers always nest within the shrub layer, but when birds start nesting in early spring, most of the tallest shrubs and saplings haven't leafed out yet. So early nests are usually located within about a meter of the ground in the dense cover of blackberry shrubs, which leaf out early. Many of these early nests get predated because they are so close to the ground. By the time the birds re-nest, many of the taller shrubs and saplings have finally leafed out. So most later nests of prairie warblers are located greater than one meter above the ground in the dense cover of taller vegetation where they are less susceptible to being found by predators. Many birds use slightly different areas for nesting based on where the cover is best as the nesting season progresses. For example, birds that nest very early in the spring, such as American robins and northern cardinals, often locate their first nests of the year in the cover of dense conifers, and they don't nest in deciduous trees or shrubs until later in the season when these trees have finally leafed out. So what we find and should expect is that habitats are usually most beneficial and support the greatest variety of wildlife species when each vegetation layer is composed of a variety of different plant species. This variety of plants provides a variety of habitat options for different wildlife species. So get in the habit of not only looking for different vegetation layers, investigate how many different species of plants or types of plants, like conifers and deciduous plants, make up each vegetation layer. Some wildlife species that are especially vulnerable to predators select very specific habitat types that provide them with dense protective cover where they can avoid predators. Perhaps the best example for this in New England is the New England cottontail. This rabbit requires dense shrubs for its habitat, but specifically, it requires dense shrublands greater than 20 acres in size so that it has a large area of cover that enable the rabbits to get away from the edges of the habitat where predators are most likely to be able to find and capture these rabbits. So just having shrub cover isn't enough. This species needs a huge area of shrub cover for us to expect it to occur and to be able to survive and reproduce. Cover objects on the ground meet multiple habitat needs for wildlife, including providing important cover from predators as well as important thermal cover. So I will talk about these functions together here. Common cover objects include fallen logs, rocks, brush piles, and logging slash. Logging slash is just the tops and branches of trees that are left on the ground in the woods after trees have been removed during timber harvesting. Logs, fallen limbs, stumps, and upturned trees are often referred to collectively as dead and down woody material or coarse woody material. I was actually trained to call this coarse woody debris, but many biologists don't like the word debris because it suggests that this material is something that needs to be cleaned up. Instead, these cover objects are an especially important component of wildlife habitat that should be left on the ground whenever possible. Many small mammals, including southern redback voles, deer mice, and white-footed mice, spend a large amount of their time within, under, or near coarse woody material in a variety of habitats. 
mainly because these wildlife are especially vulnerable to being captured by predators when they are out in the open and away from this cover. Many amphibians and snakes use coarse woody material and other cover objects as cover from predators. Snakes are here hunting too, but they themselves are also vulnerable to predators, such as hawks and owls, if they venture too far from cover. Rotting logs are especially important for amphibians, which must maintain their moisture either to breathe or to avoid desiccation. Woodland amphibians, including Jefferson salamander, wood frogs, and red back salamanders, often spend a large proportion of the summer under fallen logs because the ground under these logs is often significantly cooler and has greater moisture content than the surrounding forest floor. Redback salamanders will often congregate together and overwinter inside rotting logs. Similar to cavity trees, Bigger fallen logs are better for wildlife than smaller logs, primarily because larger logs are more likely to retain moisture in cooler temperatures than smaller logs. Fallen logs 18 inches in diameter and greater are probably the most valuable for wildlife, not only because they are large enough to provide cool and moist microclimates, but they can provide cover to a greater range of wildlife species. These larger logs are also more likely to also function as denning habitat. So you should be starting to get the idea that each habitat component may serve multiple purposes for the same wildlife species, and the exact same component may be used for very different purposes by different wildlife species. As you go outside, especially in the forest, note the presence or absence of coarse woody material. And if it's there, note whether it is mostly small diameter logs and branches, or if there are large logs present as well. Habitats that contain an abundance of large diameter fallen woody material are rare in New England and may provide especially valuable habitat to wildlife. You can learn more about the value of dead and fallen woody material and how to encourage this habitat component for wildlife in the publication Good Forestry in the Granite State. Very important thermal cover may be provided by features that are less obvious than fallen logs. For example, many turtles included painted and snapping turtles, as well as less common blandings, spotted, and wood turtles may be attracted to tall grass hayfields during the hottest portions of the summer. These tall grasses reflect a large amount of the sunlight energy off the tops of the grass. As such, the ground under these grasses is often very cool providing the turtles with a refuge from the summer heat, along with a great spot to forage on herbaceous vegetation. As habitat managers, we might delay mowing fields until late in the fall or raise the mower decks high to minimize the chances of hitting turtles that are attracted to the fields. Finally, winter is often the most stressful period of the year for wildlife that are year-round residents in New England and certain wildlife require special habitats to survive harsh winter conditions. White-tailed deer are probably the best example of a wildlife species that requires special winter habitat when snow is over 18 inches deep and the temperature is far below zero. Under these conditions, deer congregate or they yard up in deer yards or deer wintering areas. Thermal cover of deer yards is provided in hemlock, spruce fir, or northern white cedar forests where the crown closure of the trees is 75% or greater. This means that when you are in one of these forests and you look up, at least 75% of the sky is blocked by live softwood foliage. This dense softwood cover traps the snow up above the ground, which not only makes it easier for deer to travel underneath, but the snow acts like a blanket to trap the warm air below. This allows deer to significantly reduce the amount of energy they burn while moving and trying to keep warm in winter. Many other resonant wildlife, including red squirrels, porcupines, turkeys, tufted titmice, barred owls, and golden crowned kinglets will all use the cover of these softwoods to survive harsh winter weather. And you can learn more about deer wintering areas and how to manage them for wildlife in good forestry in the Granite State.